is titled My Aha Moment for those here for the Norwegian Rock. I'm going to disappoint you. This will be the one slide that mentions aha. Uh -huh. um, but as I was trying to come together with this, I kind of landed on this as my idea. And just as a side note, does anybody know what the title of this album was called? It's Hunting High and Low. So I think they were onto something. So this is me. I've um, been kicking around for a little bit. Uh, this is the first time I ever had walk-up music, so I got to do walk-up music with the Smiths, so that was very exciting as well for me, so this has been a good day. Um, I build some apps, I do a lot of blogging around hunting and sec ops, and I'm gonna tell you about uh, kind of my lead-in into this, uh, this whole thing around threat hunting today. So, I came to Splunk a couple years ago. Um, when I had first gotten on board, uh, I was doing a couple different things, and my now current colleagues and team had spun up this thing called Boss of the Sock, or BOTS. And it was a blue team capture the flag competition. They built it on realistic data sets, made it fun, put a little bit of training into this, and they really kind of got it off and running and, and came to be a big success. As we got into 2017, I joined the team and they said, hey, you know, um, we're doing this thing, would you like to do this? Yes, absolutely, I'd love to do this. And we built a fictional nation state uh, APT group called Taedonggang APT. And so this first year that I was doing this with the team, I was still kind of trying to get my bearings. I did some QA, I built some servers, helped out with the APT scenario, but I was still kind of just trying to get grounded with kind of understanding everything there. Didn't really do a lot of authoring of what the adversary was doing. We delivered this, we had uh, you know, hundreds of folks do this at our user conference, that was October time frame, about this time two years ago, and things were good. But I got a little bit busy, had other projects going on, kind of set the whole thing aside, spent a couple of months doing a couple other things. Fast forward four months, no that is not my tape deck, unfortunately I don't think my tape deck I could find a picture of anymore, but this is representative. And I came back to the hunting piece of this. And I said, you know what? We've got this APT data set. I know there's a bad guy in that data set. It would be really kind of nice to be able to start looking at this and going, well, how could I go ahead and start um, educating and going back to that earlier tenant? One of the things that we try to do is we try to train people and try to train them and explain how to do threat hunting. Because when we talk about threat hunting, th hunting means so many different things to so many people. There's three examples right there, right? That, that people do different kinds of hunting and just taking that analogy and you know, hammer, hammering it to death. Uh, so I started doing a little bit of research. I'm like, okay, how do I want to quantify this? How do I want to explain this? Because everybody uses terminology a little bit differently. And sometimes the Twitter fairy drops something on you, and that's what happened uh, on uh, February 18th, 2018. And uh, Matt Graber had posted this. I was flipping through my Twitter feed, and I landed on this, and I'm like, this is fantastic. I'm going to use this. And so this is something that I kind of like to put out there every time we start talking about threat hunting and what threat hunting is. And, and yeah, it's not, it's not perfect. Yes, there's edge cases and everything else, but I really like this just to kind of help frame that up. So then I kind of continue to do some more research. And David, uh, you know, for those who haven't seen this before, the Pyramid of Pain, right? I started looking at this and kind of going, okay, how do I want to quantify this and help show value? Um, to people as they start looking at this. And the thing I like about the pyramid is, is that it cuts both ways. It cuts two different ways, right? When we say it's easy and it's trivial to find things, it's also easy and trivial for somebody to change things, right? So the adversary is, okay, yeah, fine, I burn an IP, great, new IP, right? Um, but if I work my way up that stack, yes, it's a pain in the ass for the uh, defender, for the hunter, to find the TTPs and the tools. It's also a tremendous pain in the ass for the adversary to change those things, right? So, so yes, high, high, high work level to get there, but high value in return coming back out of it, right? So I like the idea of this to be able to start kind of framing those things up and really kind of keep those things, uh, those things in mind as to what do we want to hunt for. Now, as I kind of continued this, I said, okay, well, how do I model this? What do I want to do from a modeling perspective? And so you have the, the kill chain on the one side, the diamond model on the other side. They're both great, they're both lovely. Uh, they do a lot of good things to help describe things after I find them. But, you know, I'm not really a super creative guy from a hunting perspective. And I go, well, if I have a kill chain, I've got exploit. I could start hunting at the exploit stage, but, but what do I gonna hunt for? 
Or, hey, actives on, active, uh, actions on objectives. Great. What do I hunt for? And so, you know, while I like the models to be able to overlay things that I find, it wasn't something that was really going to be impactful. And so I came to this small little thing called the MITRE ATT&CK framework. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, what I really liked about the ATT&CK framework was, and I, I refer to it here as brain candy, because if you're maybe not as creative as other folks, and, and I'll say I'm kind of one of those people, I've got all of these techniques and all of these tactics to sit there and go, oh, yeah, let's go hunt for that. Sure, let's go hunt for this. Let's use this as a starting point to go ahead and go from there. And so what I did as I started building this out was I started using the MITRE ATT&CK framework as that technique, as that starting point, and then we'll kind of go forward here and tell you kind of where I went from there. Now, as this fine gentleman says, with great power comes great responsibility. And anytime you're dealing with a matrix, you can't just dive into it, right? No matter what Keanu Reeves says. So you need to think about it, you need to put some thought into it before you dive into that matrix, otherwise you will get lost. So, what did I do? Well, I've got three boys. They're middle school, high school now, but it was funny. Every uh, September-ish time frame, we'd have this weird homework that we'd have to do called the scientific method. And every year, we'd learn the scientific method over and over again. You'd think they'd learn it at some point. Um, now, if you go out and Google scientific method, you'll notice um, three different scientific methods there, which is kind of unfair because everybody defines it a little bit differently, but you kind of get the idea. Right? You ask a question, you do your background research, you build a hypothesis, you experiment, you analyze and draw your conclusions, and then you report your findings. Sounds pretty straightforward. We can apply that to hunting. And that's what we did. We start off by asking a question. So when I sat there and started kind of looking at this, I go, okay, what kind of a question could I ask as I went through this data set and started hunting against it? Well. If I was dealing with this maybe outwardly, I might take the external stimuli, right? The threat intelligence reports, the reports in the news, things that are happening out there, and use that as my starting point. In my case, I really didn't have that, right? I already had an adversary data set that I wanted to hunt against. Uh, so, you know, because I was going to start focusing on FTP as being something that I was going to hunt for, the first thing, and it sounds kind of brain dead obvious, but, you know, hey, what sources have visibility, data sources have visibility for around FTP? And do I have, even if I have FTP data in my data set? If I don't have it, I can't hunt for it, right? But let's ask those basic questions. Let's move to the research part of this from there. Do I have data moving back and forth across my environment? Yes, in this case I do. And just as a side note, I want to just kind of be clear about this. The things I'm talking about here, this is not pertaining to a specific tool. Any tool that you have, this is kind of the framework. I just happen to be using the tool that I have access to. So just as I'm, as I'm Talking about that, I wanted to kind of lay that out there. But when I identify those communication paths, great, I see external IP addresses, I see my internal workstations, I see FTP data there. Okay, so that kind of answers that basic question for me. I do have FTP data. I have visibility at the network level because I can see that I have my firewall data, I have host and workstations, external IPs. So this is definitely in play for me to start hunting across FTP. And I go down and look at my hosts, and I say, yes, I've got hosts out there that are, as well, that are collecting this data, and I have visibility down to my hosts. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. I have a question out there. I have visibility, so I know I have data that I can start hunting against. And then I'm going to go ahead and start looking for other kinds of associated information. The point I'm trying to hear, show you here is not that I'm, that, that I'm going to care that you're going to know what a dash I or a dash G or a dash A switch for FTP is, but my point here is, is that it's important to gather those supporting pieces of information. If I'm hunting a protocol or hunting against a protocol, I want to gather supporting information around that protocol. If I'm hunting against a language or, or code or something like a PowerShell, I want to be able to have those tools with me because I probably don't know everything about PowerShell or everything about FTP, but I have those resources in front of me so I can go ahead and cross-reference, right? So again, this is, as part of that hunting, it's gathering my tool set and pulling my tool set together before I go out there. All right, so now once I've done that, I want to go ahead and construct that hypothesis. Build a hypothesis. Where do you build your hypothesis from? Again, for somebody like myself, maybe a little less creative from this perspective, I go back to that MITRE ATT&CK technique, and on the right-hand side of the screen there, you'll see T1048. Its tactic is exfiltration. The hypothesis is exfiltration over alternative protocol. And then below that, I actually put the ATT&CK description that they have on their website that describes it. 
A little bit of foreshadowing here. There are a set of protocols in bold there, FTP, SMTP, HTTP, DNS, and some other network protocols. That's important because I'll get back to something that I learned a little bit later when I started with this uh, hypothesis and went from there. And then I just kind of refined this as data exfiltration may occur via FTP. As David pointed before, you know, you kind of have to be a little bit specific, right? Maybe you want to be very specific. Maybe you want to be a little bit looser with it. Again, this is a fairly, fairly generic, right? But at least I'm saying FTP. I'm searching FTP specifically. If I have a really large organization, maybe I want to search specific data centers, specific net blocks, specific hosts, right? We can go ahead and do those things however we see fit. But for my purposes, I said, okay, we're going to look for FTP, right, exfiltration. That's what we're hunting for. And that's where I go with my hunt. So as I'm doing that, before I go in diving in the next step, what are the things that I want to achieve out of this, right? Before I build my experiments, what are the things that I want to, what I, what I want to go ahead and do? Well, what are the things that would help me answer this question, right? Would help me confirm or refute the hypothesis, right? Can I see the commands that are issued around FTP? Can I see what user accounts are out there? Can I see what times these things occurred? Can I see what files are in motion, right? Those are the kinds of questions, of course, I'd want to ask around FTP and be able to be a little bit smarter as to know what I want to go look for. If I just want to say, hey, I'm going to hunt, okay, but I want to put some boundaries around this. So ask some of those questions before you start hunting so you know what you want your experiment to be. So let's go into experiment. First thing I did, start looking at this and going, okay, let's look at this from a time series perspective. Let's go ahead and say, okay, we have a rough idea as to when we're seeing this FTP data uh, traversing our network and, again, source and network pairs. So, right, so I, gotta, I, I, take the, I take the wide world and shrink it down to a much more narrow world of days that I need to look within. Okay, that's a good place to start, right, from a network perspective. Maybe I want to start digging in and start looking for sessions. And I can start looking at the sessions that are being, are, 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 uh, are happening on the system as well. I might want to drill down and get more specific at the protocol level and say, what are the things from a file perspective that are, that are happening in my FTP sessions, right? So again, we went quickly from date times into the protocol, into the files, right? So here, as an example, I, I saw a, a, Python, a Python script, a Python in, installer, a couple executables, uh, a .hwp file with a language that is not um, Western uh, language character set. What do I do with that? First question is, is do I start getting distracted and go, that's very, very odd in a .hwp. Should I start hunting that right now? No, no, no. I'm hunting FTP exfiltration right now. I want to stay on target and stay focused on that because it's very, very easy to get distracted with something like that and start going in a different path. But I pull out my handy dandy notebook, I make a note, and I say that's something that's going to be interesting to go back to. The fact that I've got a Python installer in here, that's interesting to go back to as well. Let's go back and look at that one, but let's hold off on that and let's focus on our question at hand. Right? And that's something I think that was very, very important as we go. And again, a little foreshadowing, we'll talk a little bit about those, um, those missteps later. Something else I did was start looking and again drilling down. So we went from days down to hours and minutes and start looking at clusters of data transmissions around FTP going out of my network. So those first set I just showed you were things that were coming into my network. These other ones are things that were going back out of the network. And we broke this down into different transmissions, and they were actually turned out to be four sets of transmissions. This is the first one on the left and the second one on the right. The first one here, we see a password file leaving the network. And again, we look inside of that and we see reply content. Again, knowing what the protocols are telling you and what the logging in the protocol is telling me, I can see that it says you uploaded three and it cuts off the K bytes, but I've got data physically leaving the network. The file names, I see a number of different PDFs leaving the network. If I look at my third transmission, I see a lot more PDFs and another long transmission time frame. And then I see a fourth thing with a thing called top secret yeast. What I didn't mention is, is that our fictional company here that was being exfiltrated is a company called Frothly. And Frothly makes yeasts kind of knock off kind of uh, brewing. And so this is kind of the keys to the kingdom, if you will. And so we see this being uploaded. But again, this is where it's also important to know what the protocols and know what the logging's saying. Because if I look at that reply content, that reply content says you have uploaded zero and downloaded zero K bytes. Sounds like an FT FTP transmission hiccuped or maybe was blocked, right? So again, understanding from a damage perspective, 
what's there and what's in that logging more than just saying, yep, a file was uploaded, because a file wasn't really uploaded at this case. It was actually blocked. But these are the kinds of things that we need to have that visibility into as we're hunting to be able to understand what that looks like. So then from there, I was like, okay, well, I got all these PDFs, and there were so many PDFs there, 400 or 300 at a time, that I don't even know what happened and what went through there. But let's go ahead and stack them and see how many times maybe the same PDFs were pulled. So I went ahead and stacked them, and I saw a number of PDFs were sent out twice. A couple of other things were sent, but they were only sent out once, including that top secret yeast that we saw. So we know that you know, kind of those keys to the kingdom were attempted to be exfiltrated, but they were only attempted to be exfiltrated once. Some of the other FTP uh, or PDF files were exfiltrated twice. Why might we have two transmissions going out? I could probably hypothesize about that, that maybe an FTP transmission, a connection failed. Anybody's FTP transmissions ever fail? Just me? Okay. Right? So, but I could go ahead and see that and, and see that those things happened as well. Then I started moving out to the host level. And I start looking at the host and saying, what were the commands that were triggering these FTPs? And so again, with the host visibility, I can see that FTP.exe was being run. Okay, that, that's, that's installed on my Windows system, fine. Uh, dash I and then dash S file.dll. Okay, what does that tell me? And this goes back to, again, if I'm gonna go hunting in this space, I kinda need to know what those switches mean so when I will go look for them, I have that context. So gathering those other pieces of supporting information are important. The dash S there is kind of like a script, you know, kind of a scripted switch, right? The idea there is, is that, you know, you don't want to necessarily say open this file, set the by, you know, set it to bin or set it to ASCII, go to this directory, upload, download, goodbye, right? That's, that's kind of what the dash S would be used for. Now, if I was in the forensics class, right, if I, if I, uh, if I had access to this box, you know, this might be, uh, that DLL might be something I'd want to go ahead and grab. Unfortunately, you know, this is a system that was brought, torn on, it's all gone, I've got logs to work with, but I don't necessarily have the DLL to go back to. And the other thing it turns out to be is, if this is scripted, why would I be calling a DLL? Does that make sense, right? So it's kind of a, oh wait, these are things that don't line up, this would be something a little bit suspicious, so that's where I want to go grab it. So I got three of those DLL things that are vague, Again, I could pivot off into that to becoming an additional hunt, right? Maybe I bound it inside of this bigger FTP exfiltration. Maybe I go ahead and hypothesize and say, hey, those DLLs seem to be happening an awful lot. Let's go ahead and do another hunt on that and then start looking at more of our network telemetry to understand maybe what those things were happening. So while I don't have the scripts, I could maybe be able to guess it out. The last one, though, I have is I have FTP open and a, uh, and a domain called hildegardsfarm.com. Now that has some value to it. Right, because now I've got a domain, and again, going back to that pyramid, right, hashes, files, I can work my way up the top. Domains aren't necessarily as trivial to change, right? That causes a little bit more pain to the adversary. So if I have something like this, this is something that has some value to me that I can go ahead and utilize and maybe use for future detection. So that's a good thing. From here, I'm gonna pivot a step farther back, which starts getting into the parent processes and start kind of looking into those parent processes and say what spawned those FTP commands. And so when I started looking at that, I see these hosts, and I see three different hosts spawning parent command lines that have encoded PowerShell. Well, I can decode encoded PowerShell, and I can start looking at that and start examining those kinds of things. So you can kind of see how I'm working from that network level, right, bounding with some time, looking at the files that are being transmitted inside and outside, right, getting down to the host level and the commands, and then looking at the parent processes and going, oh, okay, well, this is, I'm now I'm kind of getting to the heart of what's really happening here. And again, I'm building this into that, con building this into the construct of FTP uh, alternate protocol exfiltration, because that's what I'm focused on. All right, so now that I've done my experiments, I'm kind of into the ready to the analyze and draw the conclusions. So the very first thing I want to do is I want to think about what did I learn? What have I learned from from these experiments that I did. Well, I, I saw two workstations communicating externally, okay? I saw two servers, and I obviously didn't put all of my work into this thing to, uh, just from a timing perspective, but I saw two, work, two servers being only seen by my Palo Alto, so I have a visibility problem, okay? Um, my Suricata data was not, my Suricatas uh, were not seeing the server traffic, but the Palo Altos were. That's good information. Um, the adversary, a little bit hard to see with the yellow. Adversaries using FTP on the workstations to exfiltrate data. Well, we saw that with those transmission segments. 
We saw a file name with a DLL extension is going to be obfuscating a script being called. Okay, that's something that's important to understand. Seven, uh, seven files were downloaded to the workstation on the 23rd. PDFs were going out on the 25th, including you know, our most important piece of information that we found out it was blocked, and again, pivoting to find out why it was blocked. Turned out the Palo Alto was knocking that thing down, right? And we were seeing a domain because of that one FTP log going out to hildegardsfarm.com, and we could go ahead and continue hunting against that as well. So, kind of at the end of that hypothesis, was I able to confirm my hypothesis, right? Yeah, I'd say, yeah, I could confirm that hypothesis. We're seeing exfiltration, we're seeing it primarily used, we're seeing scripted actions, but we're not seeing full success. Those are good pieces of information for me to go ahead and build up. And so I was able to kind of say, yeah, I feel pretty confident with that. Now, the question becomes, what do you do with that, right? So I, I got to be over in the Netherlands earlier this year, and I went to the Asher Museum, and that's kind of where this came from. And I, I, I like Asher, um, but this, this specific picture, I think, is a really good one when you start thinking about documenting your findings, right? We all see things a little bit differently. Anybody see the black birds first? Anybody see the white birds first? Anybody see the black river and the white river and some of the symmetry there, right? Everybody sees things differently, right? And so the challenge is, is that for those of you who've hunted in the past or been SecOps folks in the past or have gotten, you know, burned by, you know, choose your favorite piece of malware, right? we all have those stings and those pain points from our prior experiences. And so we have those biases as well. And so we all see things a little bit differently. So our challenge with this is we've done our experiment, we've gathered up these pieces of information, how do we go ahead and take these pieces of information and turn it into something that's usable, not just by us, but by our SecOps teams, our threat intel teams, by all the other people to be able to disseminate this? And so that's a little bit of the challenge as we roll up to report these findings. So the first thing I like to do is I like to draw pictures. Okay, from an, from, a, from an APT perspective and lots of things bouncing around, I also really struggle with trying to go, okay, you know, the hip bone's connected to the thigh bone and the thigh bone's connected to the knee bone, right? And you're trying to connect these different pieces draw a picture, right? Um, if I had a bigger screen, I would try to draw all of my different hunts onto this screen. Unfortunately, I don't, so I'm just gonna show you the FTP exfiltration. And this is what it looks like, right? I can see what files were downloaded. I can see what files were uploaded. I can see what are the external IPs, the internal IPs, what are the commands that were issued, right? And I get that all into a visual that I can go ahead and give to somebody else and say, this is what I'm seeing happening, but I can also sit here and very easily describe it to you as well. So draw a picture, right? I think that's very, very valuable and probably something that we don't do enough of. <clears throat> Another thing I wanna do is I wanna operationalize my hunt. The worst thing that we can do from a threat hunting perspective is hunt the same thing over and over and over again. So if we can go ahead and create alerts and go ahead and do things with, with that, we can go ahead and move on to other hunts, other problems, right? You guys saw all those techniques. There's lots of techniques out there. Lots of things to explore. Why hunt the same thing over and over? So I listed off a couple of things as I was thinking about this, going, well, if I could operationalize this, what could I operationalize? Well, the blacklisting, yeah, the IP, that's low-hanging fruit, but sure, we can do that. We've got the domain, that's a little bit more valuable, right? Uh, maybe I wanna look at baseline of communications between external, external and internal systems, if possible. Maybe I wanna look for things that are not expected to be on the network. Uh, that date, dot .hwp file, right? HWP is Hangul word processing, right? It's a Korean, version of Microsoft Word, if you will, for lack of a better way to describe it. Would I expect that to be on my network? It depends on where your, where your organization is and, and who's, uh, you know, and, and where it's located in the world. But those are things that I may be saying, hey, that should never be there, I need to alert on it, right? Files of interest, right? My top secret, yeast.pdf, the keys to my kingdom. If anybody's touching that and that goes in motion, that's probably something I wanna know about. Right? But these are all things, and then the odd arguments with commands, right? A DLL with a dash S, right? But if I sat there and said, these are things that I can operationalize and I can alert on, then I don't necessarily have to go back and hunt for those things, right? I can focus on other things and make those part of my normal operational cadence. Another thing I thought was pretty, pretty good to do was as I was trying to contextualize this, I said, you know what? Exfiltration over alternative protocol. Yes, I saw a commonly used port. Yes, we were doing remote file copy. Yes, there was PowerShell. Yes, there was scripting involved. And yes, there was data encoding. These six techniques were all part of that specific hypothesis that we uncovered. And so, yeah, some of these are fairly common things, right? Commonly used ports. You're never gonna hunt for commonly used ports. I hope not. Um, good luck hunting on port 80. You'll find something, I think. Um, 
But the idea behind these is, is I can start kind of building a picture and saying my adversary or this adversary that I'm tracking uses this combination of techniques, right? And it, again, go working my way up that pyramid, if I can go ahead and make this harder and understand my, my adversary uses these five or six things at one time, maybe I can go ahead and build instrumentation around that and start looking for that combination of pieces and be a little bit more aware. Another dramatic pause. Left hand. Right here. There we go. Lessons learned. All right. So, as I was doing this and as I was building, building out my, my findings, I'd say this is probably the place where I ran into the most challenges. And so, um, a couple little pieces. One, stay on target, right? That's my first piece of guidance. When I initially built that hypothesis, and I mentioned before over the alternative protocol piece of this, the first one I did was I took MITRE's technique and said, over alternative protocol, great, I'll hunt, and hunt, and hunt, because my FTP turned into DNS, and I kept hunting, and I moved from FTP to DNS, and I kept hunting, and hunting, and hunting, and it became, you know, it, be it became the story of the, uh, with the snake trying to swallow the elephant, right? It was too much. It was too much data. It was too much to do, and so one of the things that I found to be very useful is bound that hunt try to make it into something that's chewable. I found DNS, great. Let me box this thing up, and then let me start hunting DNS, right? I can, I can have a bridge between them, but instead of just hunting and hunting and hunting, build a start and an end, be able to confirm or refute the hypothesis, and then move to the next thing. The other thing I found, and this goes back, it goes a little bit to the bright, shiny object challenge, was I actually did some hunting around PowerShell Empire in the data set. And with the PowerShell Empire data, this was great, I found this thing and I was like, man, I found this application server and I found this web server, this is great. Except it wasn't the same things associated with PowerShell Empire. It was a web application attack and I kind of stumbled into it because it's happening at the same time. Those things happen, right? You can have adversaries and red teams and other people on your networks and you stumble across people and step on top of one another, right? So again, trying to bound that and put that hunt into place so that you keep it chewable makes it a heck of a lot easier in your life. And then the bright, shiny objects are important. That's why I have a notebook. I make little notes about those things, right? I don't want to get distracted and start running off in a separate direction while I still have this fundamental question to answer. So try to keep that in mind as you're bounding this. So as I kept doing my hunts, I kept hunting and pivoting and hunting and pivoting and hunting and pivoting. And I ended up with 13 different hunting hypotheses. Uh, 10 of these are based on MITRE attack techniques. Two of them were MITRE pre-attack techniques, and one didn't really fit in nicely into that, which happened to be the suspicious user agent strings, right? But using that MITRE techniques and hunting and pivoting, hunting and pivoting, hunting and pivoting, and using the fundamentals from one hunt to draw ideas for the next, ended up with 13 different hypotheses that I kept able to, being able to iterate upon, which was pretty cool. Now, I'll show you in a second here my, um, my MITRE attack matrix. Um, but this is something else that I like to do. And I know there was, a fun, there, was a, there was an interesting back and forth on Twitter last November-ish over Thanksgiving around threat hunting and threat hunting being used for gap analysis. And I kind of fall a little bit more in the gap analysis that if I can use threat hunting and under, understand where my gaps are, I can go ahead and you know, be a little bit better about what I'm collecting so I, I don't have those gaps, right? But in our case, credential access, we didn't have a lot of information on credential access Turns out we used Mimikatz when we went back and looked at it. Well, it was all in memory. We weren't pulling memory dumps, so that was kind of a blind spot for us. Privilege escalation was also a little bit light. We used bypass user access control within PowerShell Empire, it turned out. Again, going back and looking at what we did uh, uh, historically. Um, and then we didn't see a lot of discovery to date within that system as well. Quite honestly, if you looked at those hypotheses that I had over here, I didn't really do a lot of account discovery kinds of hunts associated with it. So, that would be something, again, where I look at my gaps and go, oh, I don't see a lot of account discovery. Maybe I should go back and hunt on that. So that would become the 14th hunt here. So this is what Taidong Gong looked like at the end of my hunts. The blue, in the deeper blues are the ones that we're seeing more action activities for. So PowerShell, scheduled task, uh, data encoding, communication use port, remote file copy uh, were more frequently seen. Some of the lesser frequently seen ones from an interaction were WMI, disabling security tools, account creation, spear phishing attachment. But you can see how we can basically take these different hunts, the different techniques that overlapped against those, and map them out here to be able to go ahead and show 
kind of where the penetration is from a specific adversary perspective. So at the end of this, I could take this and actually start arming my threat intel analysts, right, using a diamond model or whatever to characterize my technical axes and my capabilities and those kinds of pieces, right? But being able to visualize this also helps me go, oh, credential access, I don't have anything there. Uh, account discovery, I see system owner and that's it. Maybe I should keep building my hunts and start rounding out what other kinds of discovery techniques maybe were being used, right? So I kind of generated my food for thought there. So what was that aha moment for me? Well, it would be a little sadistic to say that aha moment happened after 13 hunts, because this took a good long while, okay? But it really kicked in during that PowerShell hunting, right? And as I kept looking at the PowerShell data and looking at it spawning off other processes where I saw account creation, and I saw scheduled task, and we were able to start with like something from an FTP, work up into PowerShell, and then see these other things happening, it was really like, wow, this is something that I can do, this is something that we can look at, and the important thing to keep in mind is, is that we had this data set but I set it aside for four months. I didn't look at it for those four months. I was working on other project stuff. I was working on other deliverables. And I came back to this, so I was almost looking at this as like a first time user. I hadn't, hadn't really seen this before. And my takeaway for this is, is that you know, threat hunting sounds very, very impressive, and there are people out there that do an incredible job with this. But even if you're not the most seasoned threat hunter, it's not something to be daunted by, but you have to break it into those smallable, chewable pieces to be able to go ahead and take this thing down. So the last couple of parting thoughts, don't try to do this all in a single hunt. A single hunt's not gonna give you a complete picture. I just talked about one hunt out of those 13, and I showed you what you saw, and I hopefully showed you a couple different places where I could jump in different directions, but that's not the complete picture. Mind the gap, figure out where your gaps are, figure out what that logging and that, those, those gaps are that you can go ahead and put those in. Stay on target, right? Don't start going off on that bright, shiny object and get distracted or find that web application hunt and spend days churning on that. Not that that happened. Um, apply a method to your hunt, right? I use that scientific method. You can use whatever you want to, but think about it from a method perspective. I like MITRE ATT&CK because it's good brain candy. I don't have great ideas necessarily right off the top of my head to go hunt for, but I use that as a starting point and then pivot from there into in, in involving and changing my hypothesis a bit further. And then finally, operationalize your findings. You find something, when you, when you make this into a security ops piece, you need to be able to go out there and push it out from there. So we've got a couple data sets. You're more than welcome to download these. I've got a couple of blogs that, that uh, a couple of my colleagues wrote, and there's a couple of companion apps. If you guys want to go and play with this and hunt against the data set that I talked about, that's the version two. But there's a couple different versions of data sets. Those 13 hypotheses and hunts are in there as well. Feel free to play with it. Um, it's there for, you know, basically to educate and, and give people a chance to go ahead and do their own hunting, maybe that they don't want to do on their own production data sets or don't have time to do it. They can do it offline and do it here as well. Uh, with that, I want to thank everybody for being here, for listening to me for the past 34 minutes, and I guess we got about a minute and a half for questions, but otherwise I'll be here for the next two days and look forward to chatting with you further.